Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Jean-Louis Vincent, and I have the privilege and the honor to moderate this uh, interesting uh, webinar on uh, atrial relation, together with my good friend, Professor Andrea Morelli from good the afternoon. University of uh, Rome. Uh, we are pleased to do it uh, on behalf of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, and we would like to thank the Amomet company for uh, sponsoring this event and allowing us to have this discussion. As indeed, atrial fibrillation is a big problem in the intensive care unit. We know it is associated with uh, more complications and worse outcomes, and it's not easy to treat it. There, are, there is quite a lot to be said about atrial fibrillation in the critically ill. Hopefully, there are new guidelines that are quite interesting from the European Society of Cardiology and the European Heart Rhythm Association. And that's what we will review with our first uh, speaker, who is Professor Parisis, who is a professor of cardiology at the University of uh, Athens. So he will be the first uh, speaker and uh, after the second presentation of course we will have a question and answer period so think about the questions you may want to raise during this time so professor parisis welcome and uh, we are listening to you good evening thank you professor vincent uh, today we will discuss a very crucial topic about the optimal management of atrial fibrillation in critically ill patients and also patients with worsening of heart failure in the emergency department. You can see here my disclosures. And uh, we know from the recent European Society uh, Heart Failure Registry that the atrial fibrillation is a major contributor to the heart failure worsening and also a significant cause in one third of patients for new heart failure exacerbation at hospital admission. Also, we know from the previous guidelines of European Society of Cardiology on Heart Failure in this very nice diagnostic algorithm that there is need after the first hour at the exclusion of cardiogenic shock and respiratory failure that needs specific treatment and also potentially mechanical uh, support of mechanical ventilation. The second phase is after one to two hours to identify the etiology of acute heart failure through the CHAMP acronym, including also as in the letter A the arrhythmia and especially the new onset or uh, increasing heart rate, chronic atrial fibrillation. It's very important to recognize this condition as precipitating factor of acute heart failure and to give the specific treatment as, as a main suggestion in these patients is first of all to have an adequate heart rate control in order to improve symptoms and also to uh, avoid the further heart failure worsening. In the vast majority of patients with uh, acute heart failure and atrial fibrillation, the onset of atrial fibrillation is unknown, and many of these patients have chronic atrial fibrillation, and there is increase of heart rate during the exacerbation of heart failure due to excessive sympathetic activation. Thus, there is specific recommendations for acute control for the metricular rate in these guidelines in atrial fibrillation. And these guidelines suggest as a first light treatment in patients with heart failure at atrial fibrillation, dagoxin and or beta blockers, while amiodarone is second line treatment and may be considered with weak uh, indication to be at level of evidence B. In the same way, the new guidelines of uh, for atrial fibrillation published before some 
uh, some months in, uh, in European Heart Journal, uh, suggest also as a first-line treatment for rate control in atrial fibrillation, the beta blockers, second-line deltiazem or verapamil, in patients with left ventricular ejection fraction over 40, while in patients with significant left ventricular dysfunction and left ventricular ejection fraction lower than 40, these guidelines suggest beta blockers as a first-line treatment at all digoxin as a combination therapy in order to have an adequate control heart rate in these patients. Also, there is a recommendation, a resting heart rate lower than 110 is potentially the ideal uh, heart rate target for control therapy in these patients. Finally, there is a weak recommendation again for the use of amiodarone as a drug that will cause heart rate control in patients used with uh, atrial fibrillation. There is also a very nice algorithm assessing also the comorbidities and the choice of drugs for the control of heart rate. For example, if there is none of comorbidities or hypertension or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the first slide treatment is beta blocker or a bradycardic calcium channel blocker. In patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, first line treatment is a beta blocker. In patients with severe COPD or asthma, the first line treatment is a bradycardic calcium channel blocker. But I, I want to uh, speak also about the, the COPD, the classical COPD exacerbation. There is no uh, contraindication for the use of uh, beta blockers sometimes. The classical contraindication is the severe asthma or the severe COPD exacerbation with excessive bronchospasm. In the other cases, we can also use selective, beta selective beta blocker for the rate control of these patients. After this initial approach, there is the clinical reassessment, and there is no suboptimal rate control with resting heart rate uh, over 110. The second step is to combine different drugs to continue the beta blocker and to combine the beta blocker with digoxin or radicarthin calcium channel blocker in order to achieve the ideal resting heart rate lower than 110 and to improve the symptoms and quality of life of the patients. There is also a specific recommendation for postoperative atrial fibrillation. Uh, after the optimization of hemodynamics in these patients, the optimization of fluid balance and also to minimize inotrope and vasopressor use, the next step is to evaluate the hemodynamic status again of these patients. If there is hemodynamic instability, there is a need for emergency cardioversion. If there is no hemodynamic instability and there is systemic anticoagulation, the next step is for symptomatic improvement to achieve an adequate rate control with target resting heart rate lower than 100. In patients with preserved ejection fraction, the first choice is beta blocker or calcium channel blocker or digoxin, while in patients with reduced ejection fraction, the first choice is a beta blocker with combination or along with digoxin. This is a good approach in order to achieve an adequate heart rate in patients with postoperative atrial fibrillation. Looking at the available beta blockers for IV use, you can see here that there are some available in the market, but only Lanviolol and also Osmo Esmolol have a very short elimination heart life four minutes for lambiolol, nine minutes for esmolol, and also a very high beta-1 selectivity. The highest selectivity, uh, has the, the lambiolol has the highest selectivity with ratio beta-1 to beta-2, 255, 
is very high selective beta-1 blocker. The second one is the esmolol, and finally after the esmolol is metoprolol and atenolol. The other advantage of landiolol is that there is no effect, significant effect on cardiac contractility. You can see here an experimental model that in comparison with esmolol, there is no effect in systolic ventricular pressure in these experimental models. That it means that the drug does not cause worsening of heart failure due to depression of cardiac contractility. Looking also at the available clinical evidence, you can see here some trials using landiolol as a short-acting IV beta blocker with highly selective in order to reduce effectively heart rate in patients with left ventricular dysfunction and atrial fibrillation. You can see here two comparative studies. The first one with comparison between landiolol and digoxin one with comparison between landiolol and diltiazem, and finally, four other non-comparative observational studies with primary end of point, the effective reduction of heart rate at two hours after the initiation of the drugs, and as a safety end point, the absence of significant adverse effects like significant hypotension. More specifically, in the first trial, the GLAND study, you can see here for the urgent management of rapid heart rate in these patients with atrial fibrillation, there was a comparison between short-acting beta-1 selective blocker ladiol with digoxin. This figure describes this comparison at the primary efficacy endpoint of the trial. The primary efficacy endpoint was the effective degrees of heart rate lower than 110 in patients with atrial fibrillation at more than 20% decrease in heart rate from baseline at two hours after IV administration of drugs. You can see here that patients, more patients, significantly more patients exhibited the primary endpoint versus digoxin, while, on the other hand, only few patients in two arms, without statistical significance between two arms, exhibited no serious adverse events, like hypotension. That is, means that this drug is effective at, without causing significant adverse effects. You can see here the functional status, the, the effect of these two drugs on uh, primary point in relation with the functional status, New York Heart 3 or 4. There is also more effective reduction of heart rate with Ladiolol in New York Heart 3 than digoxin. It's similar effect in New York Heart for patients. Looking also at subgroups of patients in this uh, significant, important trial, you can see here that the results of Landiolol was independent of systolic blood pressure levels, left ventricular ejection fraction levels, and also New York Heart class levels. The drug was superior in improving the primary endpoint in comparison to digoxin. Also, you can see here in post hoc analysis that this effect was also independent of the age of patients, of the gender of patients, also the initial heart rate of these patients, and also the GFR, the renal function of these patients, or the treatment with oral beta blocker before the initiation of uh, IV infusions of the drugs. Another important prospective observational study on landiolol in atrial fibrillation was the AEF-CHF study, including also patients with severe left ventricular dysfunction, over 1,000 patients. It was single unblinded uh, trial 
without control group, but you can see here that in this survey that a, a large percentage of patients uh, achieved significant reduction of heart rate over 20% from baseline values, and this percentage of patients exceeded to 77%. While, on the other hand, there was no significant hypotension in these patients. That this means that also it's a safe and effective drug in real-world clinical uh, settings in order to achieve effective heart rate control in patients with atrial fibrillation. From the same study, you can see here the effect on blood pressure in overall population and also separately in patients with atrial fib or atrial flutter. On the other hand, there is gradual reduction of heart rate after IV infusion, and also the same thing, uh, separating the patients according to the existence of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Finally, there is also a single center study in 67 patients with acute decompensated heart failure admitted with worsening of symptoms at atrial fibrillation. You can see here with IV infusion of labdiolol, there was effective reduction from 141 beats per minute to 99 beats per minute with a mean dose of 3 mics per ml per min. And also the uh, systolic blood pressure was unaffected from the IV infusion. The important thing in this trial was that many of these patients had a restoration of abnormal rhythm to sinus rhythm, about 70% at the initial adequate rate control in these patients facilitates, facilitated the restoration of abnormal risk to sinus rhythm. And this patient discharged 70% in sinus rhythm, and this patient showed a lower frequency of rehospitalization the next month. Another important clinical paradigm is the role of atrial fibrillation in patients with sepsis at hemodynamic instability. You can see here a large database from patients with sepsis at 21 Patients had also atrial fibrillation in this large database. 35 of these patients received intravenous therapy for atrial fibrillations with concomitant use of antibiotic treatment. About 38% received calcium channel blocker, 28% beta blockers. And also the rest of patients digoxin and amiodarone. Looking also at the comparison between the IV infusions and the use of various drugs for the rate control of atrial fibrillation in these patients and the relationship of the effects of drugs with the mortality in these patients, you can see here that the beta blocker was superior versus calcium channel blocker in this primary endpoint, despite the pre-existing of new onset atrial fibrillation, the use or no of a vasopressor, or the existence or no of previous heart failure. The same also findings in comparison between beta blocker versus digoxin. And finally, it is impressive the superiority of beta blocker versus amiodarone also in patients with pre-existing heart failure. That is, I think it's very important with, for clinical practice. It is compatible also with the guidelines of heart failure and the new guidelines of uh, European Society of Cardiology on atrial fibrillation. There are also some small trials with the use of landiolol as uh, ultra short acting beta 1 blocker for the management of atrial fib in patients with sepsis. In this trial with 6 to 1 patients, 39 received ladiolol, 22 received diltiazem or verapamil and other drugs. You can see here that the ladiolol uh, 
have a better effect, greater effect in reduction of heart rate than control group receiving diltiazem or verapamil without significant also effect on systolic blood pressure, without causing uh, abnormal hemodynamic uh, findings in these patients. Finally, I will close the first part of theoretical presentation with the role of alveolon in the management of atrial fibrillation in post-cardiac surgery patients. There are many meta-analyses in this field. In this table, you can see at least four meta-analyses with six or seven trials, and also with landiolol, the use of landiolol, there is a reduced incidence of paroxysmal or postoperative atrial fibrillation in these patients, or there is effective decrease of heart rate in these patients at improvement of symptoms. In the same way, in this European Heart Journal supplement, there is a recommendation from the expert for management of postoperative atrial fibrillation in patients uh, with operation, non-cardiac surgery operation. You can see here there is strong recommendation for the use of ranilol because this drug has a minimal impact on blood pressure, has limited negative enotropic effect, it is well tolerated by the respiratory system. Additional benefits in these patients in the regulation of inflammatory response and also the reduction of excessive sympathetic activation contribute to the pathophysiology of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. In this last part, I will describe a real clinical case from ER, my ER department, a case of a man 72 years old, admitted to the ER with recent onset of dyspnea orthopnea, the last two hours, with a concomitant respiratory viral infection the last days. The history of patients, you can see here the history of patients, COPD, PCI in circumflex artery before three years, with a negative radioisotopic radio, uh, radio imaging technique for ischemia the last year, with chronic atrial fibrillation, with history of angioedema after administration of NS inhibitor, history of arterial hypertension, receiving in the chronic treatment carvedilol, falsartan, amlodipine, dabigatran, et statin. And the patient was ex-smoker. This is a prof classical profile of a coronary artery disease patient with history of COPD and other risk factors like hypertension on treatment classical treatment at chronic atrial fibrillation, classical treatment for uh, coronary artery disease at arterial hypertension and anticoagulant treatment for atrial fibrillation. In clinical examination of the AR, we found fourth heart sound, sorry, it's wrong here, third heart sound, mild systolic murmur at the apex, tachypnea, raised at pulmonary basis with concomitant wheezing, and increased jugular venous pressure, high blood pressure, high heart rate with atrial fib, 156 beats per minute, mild peripheral edema, and severe hypoxemia. We started also IV treatment, but you can see here the ECG before the IV use of landiolon in these patients with very high heart rate, 156 beats per minute. This was the chest X-ray findings with pulmonary congestion and without excessive increase of cardiothoracic ratio. This is also the lung ultrasound of admission, suggesting severe pulmonary congestion with over 30 uh, B lines in different pulmonary bands suggesting severe pulmonary congestion here. It's a good tool to evaluate at the acute phase the pulmonary congestion in these patients. In biochemics, there is increased level of NT pro BNP, which is very high for the age and renal function in this patient, and relative increase of high sensitive troponin T, 
without evidence of a new acute coronary syndrome, but we know that in acute heart failure there is a mild increase of troponin. It is also an uh, important prognostic factor. In ECHO, we found 11 regular ejection fraction 45%, A2E ratio 18, which is suggestive also for high elevated, for elevated 11 regular at systolic pressures, but with uh, IVC 18 millimeters, that is the, the diameter is not over 20, that is suggestive for um, over 20, suggestive for severe peripheral congestion. The initial management were to start IV nitroglycerin as dilators according to systolic blood pressure because it is a classical hypertensive acute pulmonary edema with increased heart rate due to sympathetic activation that also the increased heart rate can worsen these patients, decreasing the filling period at increasing the 11 regular diastolic pressures at also leading to worsening of pulmonary congestion. We gave also IV forosemide small dose because the patient was naive to diuretics. Started also with nebulizer ipratropium bromide and we started also than violol IV starting at a dose of one mics per kilogram per minute and aptitrating to five mics per kilogram per minute, checking also the heart rate in these patients. Stop carvedilol due to persistent wheezing that is no selective beta blocker and switch to bisoprolol five mics starting 24 hours later after uh, stopping the infusion of IV uh, lanviolol. And also we gave oxygen two liters per minute in this space. After 30 minutes of lanviolol use, you can see here that there is decrease of heart rate to one, from 156 to 138. And after 24 hours, you can see here that we achieve an optimal heart rate 104, lower than 110. That is the ideal target heart rate, resting heart rate. Uh, for after the suggestion of uh, uh, ESC guidelines. During the infusion, there is also improvement of pulmonary congestion here. There are also mild congestion after six hours of infusion of lanviolol at nitroglycerin. After uh, initial infusion, there is clinical improvement 24 hours later. There is also an effective reduction of NT-proBNP and the patient uh, connected to heart failure clinic for a follow-up appointment in the next two weeks. Here you can see also the lung ultrasound that it has. You can see here a dry uh, a dry pulmonary tissue without B lines and complete resolution of pulmonary congestion after the initial treatment with vasodilators, diuretics, and heart rate control with IV uh, landiolol. I will close my presentation with also the suggestions of European Heart Rhythm Association for the management of newly diagnosed atrial fib in critical ill in post-operated patients. In the same way, I think it's very nice algorithm in order to have an optimal management of these patients. If there is, after clinical assessment and regulation, hemodynamically stable atrial fib, the next step is to assess reversible triggers for atrial fib and to have an adequate rate control as with beta blockers or diltiazem or digoxin, verapamil, digoxin, amiodarone. But beta blockers remain the first choice for the rate control in these patients. Also, there is a specific statement to use short-acting beta blockers in the case of risk of hemodynamic stability like landiolol. And landiolol 
overcomes all limitations of clinical practice because it's very fast uh, at precise management for very fast precise management of acute atrial fibrillation. It's also first-line treatment for patients with cardiac dysfunction. It's also safe agent in patients with renal and hepatic comorbidities without causing significant hypotension or negative inotropic um, action. It also is compatible with pulmonary disease patients due to highest cardioselectivity. And finally, it has limited rebound and tolerance effect due to lack of pharmacochaperonic effect in these patients. It's very important to have in our minds to start, especially in patients with uh, left ventricular ejection fraction lower than 40, with low dose from 1 mix, a top rate to 10 mix, according to heart rate control in these patients. But I, I think that is very good choice for the treatment of critically ill patients in the ER or in ICU, especially in patients with cardiac dysfunction and hemodynamic uh, instability. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much uh, indeed, uh, John Parisis, for a very interesting presentation uh, based on these most recent guidelines and also a nice uh, patient presentation. Uh, an initial comment that you will have to address at one point or another, you use the term stability uh, several times, and I think we need to be a bit more specific. I don't know if you read our editorial in Critical Care recently about it, because sometimes the resident calls a patient who has been on large doses of noradrenaline for a while, they call it unstable, or they may call it stable, because we have not had to change the doses of noradrenaline. So are we speaking about shock, or are we speaking about some hypotension, or are we speaking about something else? But hemodynamic stability, I don't know what that is. Uh, I hope I am hemodynamically stable right now, but if I am in shock with 60 microgram per minute of noradrenaline for uh, 24 hours, you may say that I have been very stable for 24 hours. So any comment on that? Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, it depends on the patient. I think that there are uh, some patients that uh, after the initial use of uh, catecholamines, there is a very quick response. That, uh, it's, there are also some other things to estimate the hemodynamic stability, not only the systolic blood pressure or heart rate, but also, for example, the urine volume or renal function uh, or, the need, or the patient has uh, uh, lower peripheral organ dysfunction estimated, for example, for um, lactate. Uh, yeah, then you can speak about the patient. Let's speak about shock. If you see the patient has a, yeah, okay. if, if, if the lactate near yeah. normal, if there is good good volume, uh, urine volume, uh, it, 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 I think it's, it's time to start to winning from catecholamines, and if there is excessive excessive heart rate sometimes it's yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, okay it's okay also yes. concomitant short active beta blockers to facilitate the winning. hello no i think you cannot hear me okay. can you hear me now can you hear me i think you cannot hear me yeah, yeah. okay so you are now speaking about shock versus no shock. We can use the word. There is nothing bad in using the word, but the word hemodynamic stability is confusing because we will, uh, and there is a question about it, when shall we give a counter shock right away for a patient having acute atrial fibrillation? 
Yeah, there are there are two things I think. There are the the, the atrial fibrillation usually usually uh, is associated with more stable patients uh, as a precipitant factor of acute heart failure. It's it's very rare to, the atrial fibrillation to be the cause of shock in these patients. It's usually an epiphenomenon of the shock or contributes to the vicious cycle of worsening of the shock sometimes. In the cases that is the cause of shock, the first approach is to, uh, to, to perform a cardioversion, I think. If there is only as a precipitant factor, I think it's very important the rate control from the beginning and then to decide which will be the best strategy in order to uh, manage the prospectively at long term the atrial fibrillation. Because the question is also the, the, the question of uh, beta blocking agents uh, uh, like Landiolol versus uh, amiodarone. Uh, when would we use amiodarone rather than um, landiolol and vice versa? Yeah, it's a good also question. Landiolol is more effective without significant hemodynamic effect, without negative anatropic effect or effect on uh, systolic blood pressure to reduce the heart rate, especially in patients with LV dysfunction. Amiodarone is better sometimes for rhythm restoration, for rhythm control, not rate control. Yeah, exactly. But it's so, not, it's not, it's not, you can start sometimes with the short acting beta blocker landiolol to slow heart rate and then to decide which will be the next step. Very good point. Very good that point. If you decide to stop heart rhythm, potentially the next step is to start after reduction of heart of uh, dose of uh, of uh, landiolol to start the other one for rhythm control. Okay. Okay. Let's try to. Have but I think the first we thing. Have many questions. We have many questions. We are still waiting for Professor Slama, but we hope that he will be uh, connected very soon. But some people ask here, let's have short answers. Has Landiolol been compared to other IV beta blockers in uh, clinical trials? No, there is, a, I, I, I showed some data in comparison with digoxin and also in comparison with uh, diltiazem. There is no, uh, there is no direct comparison with Esmolol, for example, except experimental. Uh, okay. Okay, okay, experimental okay, okay, okay. Thank you, John, because our time is very limited, and um, I'd like to give uh, the the microphone to Andrea Morelli, who will introduce uh, Professor Slama, and thereafter, hopefully, we will have time for a few more questions. But Professor Slama could be connected, and so we welcome him. Andrea, go ahead, please. Thank you, Thank you Professor Vessan. Uh, I think that the loss of myocardial performance um, very, very often occurs in patients for suffering from severe COVID. And I'm very happy that there is now uh, Michel Slama uh, from the hospital, University of this Hospital of Amiens, uh, which will address this aspect in his presentation. Thank you, Michel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you so much, Jean-Louis. I hope that you can hear me. So I will start, of course, uh, this presentation. As you know, as it was already discussed, the infection due to coronavirus may induce some cardiac complications like myocardial injury, myocarditis, acute myocardial infection, heart failure, Arrhythmias, of course, we will speak about um, atrial fibrillation, shock, cardio, cardiac um, arrest, and um, venous uh, thromboembolic event. And you know that um, um, many times this infection occurs in uh, patients with some uh, 
uh, risk factors like uh, the the age, like uh, cardiovascular disease, lung, renal, diabetes, like um, systemic inflammation, coagulation, abnormalities, and so and so. And it means uh, as well that if you look at the prevalence of the and the underlying uh, cardiovascular disease in uh, SARS-CoV-1, uh, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2, you see that um, the uh, the percentage of patients, so the prevalence of the uh, uh, underlying cardiovascular disease is much higher in um, patients with a new SARS-CoV-2. So it means that uh, during um, this um, epidemic, so we are facing with many cardiovascular problems in patients with a COVID-19 infection. And if we try to, um, to, um, to analyze, in fact, the, the factors which may um, uh, induce myocardial infection, uh, heart failure in patients, and uh, arrhythmias, you see that there are many different factors like direct vascular infection, like uh, pro-inflammation with cytokines, um, with a hypercoagulability, with stimulation, sympathetic, sympath sympathetic st st um, stimulation, hypoxemia, myocardial um, uh, hypoxemia, myocardial de depression, and so and so. And now, if you you move on uh, on the um, the cause for arrhythmias, uh, the cause of um, of uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, that you can see that it's possible that uh, the uh, an infection by itself, I mean the virus by itself, may cause some injuries, um, some uh, some myocardial injury directly or through uh, interleukin 6 or even when you you give some drugs so you you may induce some uh, uh, cardiac um, dysfunction and if you look at the noradrenaline norepinephrine uh, that we use we often use this norepinephrine in patients with uh, COVID-19 infection, and you see that uh, norepinephrine may induce inflammation and may induce interleukin uh, generation in macrophages and in, in the, uh, of course, in the heart as well. So I would like I would like to to show you some some slide. I'm sorry because it, it's not exactly the, the the last presentation. I got some problems with the um, my, 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 my computer, but I would like to show you um, some slides uh, regarding a study that we did in our institution. So um, in uh, not in a 20 patient who died after COVID-19 infection, so we decided to do some post-mortem lung biopsies, but not only lung, but as well cardiac, as well muscles biopsy, uh, liver and kidney biopsies. And we would like to analyze if the COVID, if the, coronar the coronavirus is involved in a different uh, uh, organ injury. And just to show you this well-known now uh, lung injury, you see that the lung is really destroyed with many inflammatory cells inside the lung and with some fibrosis as well. But what I would like to show you that in one patient, we uh, we got a, a, a true a corona, corona, coronavirus inside the myocardium. And we, we have here some uh, 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 inflammatory cells like lymphocytes. And uh, by doing the uh, electronic microscopy, so we uh, found that the virus was here in one patient over 20. And you see here inflammatory cells inside the uh, myocardium. But what we have seen as well that in eight or 20 patients, we got some microthrombus. It's well known that uh, the pulmonary embolism is very frequent in patients with COVID-19 infection. And you can see here some microthrombus in a small and big, uh, a big lung uh, vessels in, uh, 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 and so 
and, and so we, we find that very, very frequently. And what we discovered is uh, most of the patients who died from the COVID-19 infection, it was due to the uh, congestive heart failure. And uh, uh, we discovered in 11 patients some fibrosis inside uh, the heart. It could be an old fibrosis due to the myocardial infection, to a pre previous cardiac dysfunction, but as well, um, we don't know if it is not maybe due to uh, some um, uh, viral replication and inflammation into the uh, myocardium. So we got in 11 patients uh, this kind of uh, myocardial uh, fi fibrosis. And I would like to show you some, some imaging, some heart imaging. Of course, you recognize uh, the uh, CT scan of a patient with a COVID-19 infection. But let me show you some 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 heart uh, imaging. Uh, so here we have the echo with the the left ventricle, which is a, a small hypokinetic. Sorry, it doesn't run, but I would like to tell you that it is severely hypokinetic and short axis view as well. The the, the right ventricle as well could be uh, dilated with a systolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. It's a, the same patient. And uh, I would like as well to show you that uh, the, uh, you may have as well a diastolic dysfunction is a, a, a special assessment of the diastolic dysfunction here. And you have an E prime, which is very small. It means that the, uh, the relaxation of the left ventricle is really impaired. And here it is an, an analysis of the contraction of the right ventricle and the contraction of the right ventricle is severely impaired. And the last imaging that I would like to show you here, it's a dilation, civil dilation of the right ventricle when you compare with the size of the left ventricle. And so here it was due to an acute corpus pulmonale, due to pulmonary hypertension, due both to the ARDS and due to the mechanical ventilation as well. And so I would like to show you the, the findings of the studies that uh, our Chile uh, colleagues uh, um, uh, have, have done uh, in their institution, analyzing 60 patients. Um, and uh, on these 60 patients, they did uh, an echocardiographic examination. And what do they found? They found that first, in 70% of cases, the heart will uh, was hyperkinetic with an, uh, an ejection fraction higher than 60%. Uh, and uh, that's the, 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 the most frequent, um, uh, uh, um, uh, how, the most frequent discoveries that uh, we we have when we do echo on patient on uh, with the COVID-19 infection. But in 28% of cases, uh, we demonstrated that the ejection fraction was abnormal, uh, lower than, um, than uh, uh, 60 or even less than 45%. Uh, and so in 30% of cases, we had a right ventricular dilation. And in 7% of cases, we, we had an acute core uh, pulmonary. I would like to show you this um, a very na nice uh, case in which um, uh, the Italian authors uh, demonstrate a, a, a true uh, impairment of the, of the heart in, a co in one COVID-19 patient with the, you see that uh, 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 real abnormal in imaging using the uh, MRI. But what I would like to, to remind you that uh, over two studies, two Chinese studies, is that when um, a COVID-19 uh, um, uh, patient has uh, a cardiac injury assessed by abnormal or elevated troponin, so the mortality is higher than when the patient do not have uh, any abnormal uh, troponin level. And if unfortunately uh, the patient has both high elevated troponin as well as uh, a previous or a, a current cardiac cardiovascular disease, so the mortality of the patient with, the, with coronavirus infection is very high. 
Another study which demonstrates exactly the same with a, a, a large number of, of patients, 416 patients, uh, among which 20% got a cardiac injury. And you see that the patient with a cardiac injury had a, a much lower survival rate than patient without um, cardiac injury. And so I would like to move now to the uh, to, to, to the management of patients uh, with COVID-19 infection and cardiac disease. And, and again, because uh, most of the patients, they have a previous cardiac disease or because as they have sometimes some uh, uh, direct cardiac infection due to the virus or due to the uh, inflammation induced by the virus. So we have many patients with the atrial fibrillation. And so if we would like to manage the patient and if we would like to see what what is the proposal again uh, from the European Society of Cardiology? So just to, to remind you that there's a previous discussion. So you see that when uh, the uh, atrial fibrillation is associated with hemodynamic instability, and I do remember that we may have a discussion about this hemodynamical instability, of course, we have to do an emergency cardioversion. But in, mo in many cases, in fact, this the uh, hemodynamic is uh, stable and then uh, of course we have to give a syst systemic anticoagulation but at that time we have to discuss and um, to choose between two different ways either rhythm control or a rate control and you see that uh, the uh, this uh, recommendation coming from the european society uh, so uh, proposed beta blockers either in preserved uh, left ventricular ejection fraction as well in reduced reduced left ventricular ejection and so I would like just to go through some uh, uh, some actions, positive actions of the beta blockers. Just to remind you that the, the beta blockers do not have only uh, an action on the heart by decreasing the heart rate, but, uh, but as well has many different uh, actions and, uh, on the uh, on the platelet accumulation, on the production of thromboxane, on um, the, uh, the stress on the atherosclerosis plate, has as well a, an antioxidant uh, properties. So when we use the beta blockers, we uh, we use not only a, a drug which may uh, uh, slow down the heart rate and maybe um, uh, uh, do uh, some uh, rhythm control in atrial fibrillation, but as well we expect uh, so many uh, other uh, different positive effects. And I would like to show you this uh, study which was performed on, on animals. And you see that when on these animals uh, uh, we induce uh, uh, by injecting uh, by in, injecting an LPS uh, a sepsis like uh, syndrome uh, so of course we have a very high uh, 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 very high dosage uh, level of TNA for uh, interleukin 6 and other protein of inflammation and when uh, to this animal we give some here it was beta blockers it was lanthanol you see that the uh, the inflammation induced by the lps is really dramatically uh, reduced so it means that uh, it is a good demonstration that again the lanthanol and the beta blockers do not have only and uh, an effect on uh, the heart rate. Just I would like to go through the effect to the, to, to the effect and the, the pharmacology of the, the landiolol. Again, it's a, uh, it's a, a, a beta blocker, because beta blocker which has many uh, uh, very interesting effect because 
the half time is uh, four minutes. Uh, fast onset action is very, uh, very short. So the short duration of actions, it, it's very important. It means that when you start uh, to treat the patient with a longer load, so if you, you have any problem, so you just have to switch off the sear angle and then the effects stop almost immediately. And that's very, very important thing when we manage patients in atrial fibrillation or with a very high heart rate uh, in COVID-19 infection, as well as in uh, a patient with a shock or septic, septic shock. And I would like to show you two different points. The, the half time, which is very, very short, much shorter than all other beta blockers, particularly shorter than the S molar, which was uh, used in uh, uh, for uh, uh, in in many intensive care units. And another point, which is very interesting, uh, I, I would like to point it out to point it out is that the uh, beta, one, beta 1 and beta 2 selectivity, means the uh, cardio selectivity, it's uh, uh, very, very, very high. And it's very important because when you look at the effect of the beta receptor B1 and beta 1 on beta 2, you see that beta 1 or on, on the heart. And beta-2 are on the heart, but as well on arteries and veins, and particularly on the bron bron bronchi. So it means that when you give beta blockers with an effect on beta-1 on beta-2, so you may induce a bronchodilatation and not only a decrease, uh, a decrease in the heart rate. And, a, and, a, 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 and so it means as well that um, more the uh, higher is the uh, cardio selectivity of a beta blocker, uh, better is for the heart and better is for the, the bronchi, of course. And here, if you, you look at the, the second part of this, um, of this slide, you see that for a patient in critical situation, it is important to reduce the heart rate, to decrease the oxygen consumption, to improve the diastolic function of, um, of the heart, and, and as well, it's very important to have a, a high selectivity to block only the beta-1 receptors and not having any effect on, on uh, the, the, the bronchi. And uh, uh, so I would like now to, to show you um, the, 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 the results of uh, this study, uh, which is a very interesting study of uh, the use of the landiolol in, uh, in a patient with the, um, sepsis, uh, with a septic shock, and with a tachyarrhythmia, with atrial fibrillation. And uh, you see on, um, on the right-hand side of the uh, of the slide and on the top of the slide, you see the incidence of the new onset of atrial fibrillation. And this is very important. It means that the beta blockers, the landular, not only decrease the heart rate, not only may uh, uh, control the, 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 the rhythm, but as well may reduce the new onset of atrial fibrillation. And now if you look at, which is very important in ICU patient, is the mortality. So you see that there is a trend, it's not significant, but there is a trend to reduce the uh, mortality. So I would like to, to finish by showing you um, uh, two or three slides regarding um, two patients who uh, were in our, uh, very recently in uh, our intensive um, care unit. This first patient was a patient with a classic and typical COVID-19 infection. And the patient was uh, under noradrenaline at around one to two millig uh, milligram per hour. The patient was under dexamethasone um, as well. And so the patient's heart rate was a, lit a little bit uh, higher. And unfortunately, because the patient had a lot of edema, uh, so we decided to give some um, fu furosemide to the patient. And so we had a high uh, diuresis in this patient. And then maybe we induce a, a little bit of uh, hypovolemia. 
in this patient. And due to that, maybe, so if you look on the, on the square, the red square, you see that the patient suddenly moved to, from the um, uh, sinus victim to atrial fibrillation. And so we just, in this patient, had just to give uh, some fluid, uh, to infuse some fluid to the patient and uh, to uh, saline. And so we uh, got a, a reduction. You see that the heart rate moved from 150 to uh, 80 or 90 beats per minute. So it means that, uh, of course, we have always to try to to correct all the different uh, factors which may induce atrial fibrillation in uh, COVID-19 infection uh, patients. And I would like to show you another patient in which, uh, despite we did the correction of this uh, of different uh, risk factors, hypokaliemia, uh, hypovolemia, and so and so, it was a, a patient of 67 years old. This patient, as well, was uh, under uh, noradrenaline, was under mechanical ventilation, deeply um, sedated, and the patient developed uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, as you can see here, and moved from 99 to 150 beats per minute. And so the mean, the mean pressure, the, the mean pressure was around 70 uh, or 80 millimeters of mercury. And so we decided to um, start uh, uh, to treat the patient with the landiolol. The patient had a, a normal system systolic function assessed uh, using uh, uh, transthoracic echo. So we started with a low dose, uh, something like uh, uh, two or three uh, microgram per kilogram per hour. Uh, usually we started at one, even lower than one. Um, in patients, for example, in septic shock, uh, if we would like like to use the landular uh, for decreasing the heart rate. We start at, at 0.1 microgram per kilogram per minute and we increase uh, We increase the, the, um, uh, the dosage uh, uh, up to uh, uh, one, two, three, five, and sometime we may uh, move up to uh, uh, 30 or 40 microgram per kilogram per minute. Here, uh, we got the reduction of the patient. You see that the, the uh, uh, tachyarrhythmia was um, uh, treated and we moved from atrial fibrillation to sinus rhythm in a uh, few hours uh, with the uh, landular infusion. And so we had something uh, like here like, uh, uh, like 15 micrograms per kilogram per minute to, to reduce this um, atrial fibrillation again. The, one of the very important points when, when we decide, when you decide, when somebody decides to use the, the landular to, um, to reduce or the heart rate or uh, to try to do a, a little more control in a patient in atrial fibrillation or in patient with a very high uh, heart rate in uh, septic shock or in patient with a COVID-19 infection. So we are always it is very important to start with a very low dose and to slowly and slowly increase the dose to avoid any um, any effect any uh, um, any complications due uh, to uh, to the drug and then I would like to to conclude um, with um, the fact that the cardiac failure observed the uh, in uh, COVID-19 in, uh, in the patients is due to uh, previous disease like a myocardial, myocardial infection, is due to a direct replication of the virus and the direct effect on the right, on the heart, and to an indirect effect on, on the heart due to inflammation and so on. And the atrial fibrillation is really frequent in ICU uh, COVID-19 uh, infected patient and so should be managed either for rhythm or rate control. And for us, the beta blockers 
are uh, the uh, first line drug in this clinical situation. And we use this drug uh, in uh, a patient with uh, uh, normal ejection fraction as well as in patient with a systolic dysfunction of, of the left ventricle. And, uh, and because the lanzolol has a very short life, half time life, and because the, the lanzolol has a very high uh, cardiac selectivity, so it is for us the, the drug of choice because we, we may stop the drug and then the effect stop uh, uh, as soon as you 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 stop the, the infusion of of the drug so this, this is my my conclusion and of course andrea and uh, jean louis uh, i am ready to try to um, answer to uh, any uh, question regarding this presentation thank you michelle for this very exhaustive presentation and i don't know how many minutes uh, do we have for for the discussion because uh, uh, maybe we are a little bit late but five, five. minutes so um only five minutes just two uh quick questions the first one is how can we uh manage um the lanyard discontinuation um we have to titrate down very slowly. How can we prevent a rebound effect in case of a sudden discontinuation of glandular? That, that, that's a very good question because, as as you know, of course, uh, in um, when patient has a cardiac disease, a myocardial previous myocardial infection, and the patient is under beta blockers. So when you stop the beta blockers, so you may induce a worsening of the clinical situation of the patient, and so in. Uh, our um, in uh, our intensive care unit, uh, what we do is we 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 don't stop um, the um, the beta blockers, the, the landiolol immediately after the uh, the uh, lithium control, but we usually decrease the the, the beta blockers. We 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 give the half dose. The, the, uh, uh, from the dose uh, which um, was uh, efficient to uh, to uh, to move to the uh, uh, to, to the normal victim, but we stop after a few hours the um, the beta blockers. So it is different when we are trying to reduce the heart rate in patient uh, with a septic shock. In patient with septic shock, we slowly and slowly decrease the, uh, the landiolol, but always we try not to to give too long this to 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 long time to long duration time this drug. Most of the time, after two days. We stop the um, the landiolol uh, uh, infusion. All right, Th thank you, Michelle. And then the other one is, um, what about norepinephrine? Uh, did you note uh, a decrease in norepinephrine when you slow in heart rate, uh, or uh, or an increase in norepinephrine? Conversely. Uh, really, uh, in our uh, experience, because we are uh, moving up slowly, very slowly, the, the dose of landiolol, usually we don't have to increase uh, nor adrenaline in patients um, um, in uh, patients in which we use uh, the landiolol. In set, we, we have a, a large experience in patients with a septic shock. Uh, sometimes, sometimes that's true that we have a decrease in mean arterial pressure, and sometimes we have to increase a little bit the noradrenaline. So, but most of the time we have almost no effect on the mean arterial uh, pressure. For patient, uh, uh, for patient in atrial fibrillation, it depends. It depends as well. In uh, in uh, several patients, uh, when uh, we um, reduce uh, the atrial fibrillation and when we move to the sinus rhythm, due to the the fact that we improve the diastolic function, so we uh, improve the um, the stroke volume, but 
due to the fact that we reduced the heart rate, we uh, we have almost always the same cardiac output, and so it means that the the, 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 the mean arterial pressure do not increase really and stay almost at the at the same level. So, just to to summarize, um, most of the time we don't have a lot of change on the mean arterial pressure most of the time, and most of the time, even if we had very small decrease in mean arterial pressure, particularly in patients under norepinephrine. Sometimes we had to increase slightly the norepinephrine infusion. All right. And just uh, the last question from the auditorium that I think that's very interesting. And um, you reported in your uh, study 60% of patients in a uh, hyperkinetic state. Uh, this because it was due to probably. Um, a conservative fluid strategies, or or why uh, uh, so high uh, percentage of patient with uh, hyperdynamic state? Or what what is your point of view? My point of view is um, due to this hyperkinesia is due to many different factors for me. Uh, first, it's due to the fact that the heart rate um, uh, increased due to the uh, infection itself, due uh, uh, to the, uh, the fever, due to, to the vasodilation induced, induced by the sedation, and then we have to use noradrenaline, uh, in this patient, even if we use a low dose of an adrenaline or noradrenaline, most of our mm -hmm. patients with COVID-19 infection, they need uh, some noradrenaline between some sometimes 0.5 milligrams per hour or one milligram per hour. And all these factors, I think, induce tachycardia, which induce um, hyperkinesia of, of the heart. So it is, it, this is for for me, uh, the, the explanation, I think that there is many different factors that may explain uh, this hyperkinesia. Um, uh, related to, the, to your question, in, uh, in, uh, in several patients, um, the, uh, we, we got some um, fluid responsiveness. Uh, so it means that the patient is a little bit hypovolemic. Uh, at least uh, had a central hypovolemia. And so in this patient, when we give some fluid, in fact, we decrease a little bit the heart rate, but it's, um, it's not like a septic shock patients. Um, in, uh, in many times, it's very hard, very, uh, very difficult to, to stop the noradrenaline, and it's very hard to decrease the, the, the heart rate and to decrease this uh, uh, hyperkinetic state. So maybe different factors are involved in, uh, for me in uh, this uh, uh, hyperkinetic heart. All right, thank you. I have no further question. Professor Vincent, do you have any question for Professor Zlama? Well, I have many questions, but uh, I'm afraid now our time has been, uh, has been used and uh, I think it's time to, to conclude. Uh, Andrea, please. I agree. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have to conclude. And thank you, all of you, for your presentation and to all the audience for this very interesting meeting. I think that controlling heart rate is still an hot topic. Now we are a new drug, maybe a safer drug. I'm quite speculative, but I think that it, it, there are several findings uh, for better safety profile with Landy or with other compounds such as ESMO. Thank, Thank you for uh, participating to this very interesting webinar. Thank you to all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.